This is Jeremy Clark of JeremyBytes.com, and today we're going to continue our discussion of Lambda expressions and link in C-sharp. Previously, we took a look at the syntax of Lambda expressions and also saw a cool feature called captured variables. And last time, we took a look at the syntax of link methods so that we could figure out how to use them easily in our code. This time, we're going to be looking at declarative programming. Specifically, we'll see how link can help us add declarative style into our existing code. But first, we need to look at the differences between imperative programming and declarative programming. With imperative programming, we're telling the computer how to do something. We're taking full control of the process and we have to manage all of the pieces. With declarative programming, we're telling the computer what we want and we're letting it figure out the best way to accomplish that task. Now, as an example, let's look at animation. Now, in the WinForms world, when we wanted to do animation, we pretty much had to do everything ourselves. So we would set up a timer, and each time the timer would tick, we would tell our object to move three pixels. Then we would tell it to move again, and we would tell it to move again. And then once it got to its endpoint, we would tell it to stop. In this situation, we're taking full control over how to do this animation. And if we want to add cool effects like easing to the beginning or end of the animation, now we're doing some really tricky math to try to figure that out. Now, one thing I love about WPF is it has a very declarative nature, and that includes the animation. So in the WPF world, if we want to animate an object, what we say is start here, end here, and take two seconds to do it. And you know what? Why don't you add some easing as well? And then we let the computer figure out exactly what needs to be done. This takes a load of responsibility off of us, and it makes our code much easier to read. What we'll see is we can use link to bring declarative style programming into our existing code. So let's go back to our application and take a look at exactly that. So here we are in Visual Studio, and we're going to go back and look at code that we built in part one of this series, specifically the code to set the selected item after we update our list box. Let's run our application to get a reminder of the functionality. So when I click the refresh button, we have items that come in from our library. Then if I select an item, like Dylan Hunt, we show that selection in the upper left corner of our screen. And when I refresh the data, we'll see the selection stays in place. That's because even though we're completely replacing the items in our list box, we've saved off a copy of the selected item, and then we would locate it after we reload our list box. Now since we're looking in the items of our list box, this has the effect of working with filters as well. So if we filter it and the selected item is still there, then we see we maintain our selection. However, if we select a filter that does not include that item, then the selection goes away. So let's go to our code and remind ourselves how we put this together. This is all happening in our refresh button underscore click method that we have here. At the top of the method, before we do anything else, we save off a copy of the current selected item in the list box. This gives us a value that we can compare against later on. Then we do the work inside the body of our Lambda expression. Now the first thing we do is we repopulate our list box. We do this by setting the item source property, and you can see we are also filtering and sorting our results like we added last time. After that, we try to set the selected item. So the first thing we do is we make sure that our selected person is not null. If it is null, that just means we didn't have a previous selection. After that, we for each through all of the items in our list box, and we try to find an item that matches the first name and the last name of our saved off person. If we do find that, then we set the selected item property of the list box. Now this code works, and it does exactly what we want it to do in this case. But there's a few things that I don't like about this particular code. The main thing that I don't like about this is the thing that we're trying to do is buried two levels deep inside the for each and the if statement. What we actually want to do is set the selected item of our list box. But we have to drill all the way into this statement to find that. The other thing about this block of code is I have to do some thinking to figure out how it will behave in different situations. So for example, what happens if it does not find a match? Well, in this case, the selected item would remain unchanged, which means it would maintain whatever previous value it had. Now I have to think about it in this case. Since we completely replace the items in our list box, selected item will be null, and so it will maintain that value. 
Now what happens if it finds more than one item that matches? Now that's not hard to figure out, but we do have to think about how this behaves. In this case, if there's more than one match, it will actually select the last item that it finds because it keeps iterating through that for each loop. Now if we were to change our code a little bit and add a break, now it would use the first item that it finds. And is this code hard to figure out? Definitely not, but we do have to stop and think about it a little bit. Now this is a classic example of imperative programming. I'm telling the computer exactly how to find this item. I say, I want you to iterate through each item on the list box. Each time you come across an item, I want you to compare the first name and the last name properties. If they match, then go ahead and set the selected item. If not, keep going to the next item in the list, and it will just keep iterating and iterating and iterating until it gets to the end of our collection. But what I'm going to do instead is use a link method to turn this into a more declarative statement. We'll let the computer figure out all of the details of how to locate the item. We'll just tell it what we want. So first let's go to help and take a look at the methods that we're looking for. And again, the link methods are located on the iEnumerable interface in the extension methods. Now the method that I'm going to pull out is one that's called single or default. So let's go ahead and locate that. And we'll go ahead and select this signature right here. Now if we look at this signature, it should look familiar. It is very similar to the where method that we looked at last time. So this is an extension method on iEnumerable of T source. And again, we can replace T source in this case with the person class that we're dealing with. So this operates on an iEnumerable of person, but notice the return value. Rather than returning an iEnumerable, this is returning a single item. And in our case, that item will be a person object. Now, if we look at the predicate parameter, this should look familiar. This is exactly the same predicate that we had when we looked at the where statement. So this is a func of t source bool, which again in our case will be a func of person bool. And that means we need to provide a method that takes a person as a parameter and returns a true false value. Now I'll talk about the full functionality of this method in just a bit. For now, let's go ahead and add it to our code. So here's what the primary difference is going to be. Rather than for eaching through the items in our list box, we're going to run a link method against it. What I really like about this is I get to put the thing that I really care about, the selected item of our list box, right up front. So I actually say person list box dot selected item equals. This tells me right away exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to set the selected item of the list box. Now we're going to be looking at the items property of the person list box. Now what we've been doing with our other collections is just saying dot and then locating single or default or whatever method we want to use. But notice that single or default is not showing up in this collection. That's because items is not a strongly typed collection. This is an item collection object which does implement the iEnumerable interface, but it does not implement the iEnumerable of T interface the strongly typed interface that we need in order for single or default to work. Now fortunately for us, there is a link method that we can use. Let's go back to help, and I'm going to take a look at the ofType method. So let's scroll up a bit, and here's the method that we want, ofType t result. Now this method signature is a bit different from the ones that we've seen before. It is an extension method, which we can tell by the this keyword, but instead of operating on iEnumerable of t source like our other methods have, this just operates on iEnumerable. So this will work on an enumeration that is not strongly typed, and that's exactly what we have in this items collection in our list box. Now notice the return that we get back from this. It's an iEnumerable of t result. So we're taking an iEnumerable that is not strongly typed and turning it into an iEnumerable that is strongly typed. And all we need to do to select that type is fill in the t result generic type parameter that we have. Now at first glance, this looks like something that would be doing a cast on the items in our enumeration, but that's not actually the case. Instead, it's doing a filter on those items. What that means is that if we come across an item that doesn't match our generic type, it doesn't throw an exception. It just does not include it in the result. Now in our case, this is gonna be pretty easy because all of our items are of the same type and they are all of type person. So let's go ahead and add this method to our code. 
So now we'll just say items dot of type. And then this is where we'll put in our person. And this is a method. So we do need to include the parentheses. And the result coming back from this is an I enumerable of person. Well, that's exactly what we need for our single or default method. So let's go ahead and say dot single or default. And notice we do have IntelliSense coming up at this point. And in here, we need to put a Lambda expression. And there are two overloads for single or default, one that doesn't take a parameter and one that does. If you want to see the differences between these, I actually do have an article on my website that talks about this. And if you follow the links for this video, you'll find a link to that article. Now, in this case, we are using the one with the predicate. So again, we need a func of person bool. So a Lambda expression that takes a person as a parameter and returns a true false value. So we'll just use P for our person and we'll say goes to P dot last name equals selected person dot last name and P dot first name equals selected person dot first name. And the last thing we need to do is just add our semicolon at the end of our statement. So now that we can see the code, let's talk a little bit about how single or default works. Now single or default uses this predicate to try to find a matching item in the enumeration that we're looking at. So again, this is looking through the items in our list box. Now if it finds a matching item, it's going to return that item. And that's what we assign to the selected item property of our list box. But what happens if it doesn't find any items? Well, that's what the or default is. If this cannot find any matches, it will return the default value for that type. So because person is a reference type, it will return a null. Now, if we were using a value type such as integer, it would return the bitwise zero for that, which would be zero in the case of an integer. Now there is another scenario. What if this finds more than one item in our collection that matches? Well, single is expecting to find only one item, which means if it finds more than one, it will throw an exception. And that's actually the behavior that we want in this case. We're expecting to find one item at the most in our collection. Now, because I know the behavior of this method, I know exactly what to expect. Our selected item will either be a matching item if we find just one, it will be null if we find no matching items, and if we happen to find more than one match, it will throw an exception. And if we run our application, we'll see that this operates exactly the same way that it did before. So if we select Dylan Hunt and refresh our data, again, we'll see it maintains that selection. If we apply a filter where he is included, then it does maintain that. And if we include a filter where he's not included, then we get null back because it doesn't find any matching items at all. Now, what if this isn't the exact behavior that you want? Well, singular default actually has some friends. So let's go back to help and take a quick look at those. So here's the singular default method that we selected. And again, if it finds zero items, it returns null. If it finds one item, it returns that match. And if it finds more than one, it throws an exception. Now it does have a sibling method called single. It's expecting to find one and only one item. So in this case, if it finds one item, it will return it. But if it finds zero items, it will throw an exception. And if it finds more than one item, it will throw an exception. Now these methods do have a cousin, which is known as first. So let's take a look at that. So here's the method first. So how does first behave? Well, it's expecting to find at least one item. So if it finds one item, it will return that. If it finds more than one item, it will return the first one that it comes to. And if it finds zero items, it will throw an exception. Now there's another method here, first or default. In this case, we get no exceptions at all. If it finds one item, it returns that. If it finds more than one item, it returns the first one that it comes across. And if it finds zero items, it will return the default value for that type. So we can see it's pretty easy to choose among these four methods to get the behavior that we want. Now, if you wanna get a little crazy, there is also a last and last or default. Again, there's a ton of really cool methods in the link extension methods. Take some time, go through the list, and just explore to see what's actually there. So if we go back to our code, now we have a more declarative style. Rather than doing a for each and an if statement, we're using the single or default method. And when we use the single or default method, we're saying, you know what? I don't care how you figure this out. All I know is I want you to give me one item 
or a null back depending on what you find. And here's the condition that I would like you to use. And because we understand the behavior of this method, we know that if it happens to find more than one item, it will throw an exception. The thing that I really, really like about this block of code is the thing that I want to do is right up front. I want to set the selected item. So now I don't have to drill in two levels in order to find out what I'm really trying to do here. And if we compare this to our previous code, we can really see that difference more clearly. So rather than having to drill into the middle of the code block, we look right at the front of this code. So what we've seen today is the difference between imperative programming and declarative programming. With imperative programming, we're telling the computer how to do its job. So in our case, we were using a for each loop to iterate over items, and we were using an if statement in order to find a particular item, and then we were assigning that to the selected item. But with declarative programming, we tell the computer what we want, and we let it figure out all of the details. So rather than going through that iteration, we just say, you know what? Single or default, give me one or give me null. And you know what? If you find more than one, give me an exception. And then we let the computer figure out how to actually locate those items. Now, I'm a really big fan of the single and first methods that we looked at. Here's a chart that shows how the different methods behave. So again, if we call single, if there's zero matches, we get an exception. If there's one match, it returns that item. And if there's more than one match, it throws an exception. For single or default, if it finds no items, it returns the default value. And again, that will be either null for reference types or bitwise zero for value types. If it finds one match, it returns that item. And if it finds more than one, it throws an exception. And we can see for first, if it finds no matches, it throws an exception. If it finds one item, it gives us that item. And if it finds more than one, it returns us the first one that it comes to. And with first or default, we won't get any exceptions at all. We'll either get the default value if it finds nothing, or we'll get the first item that it comes to. So today we saw how Link can help us write declarative code. Code where we tell the computer what we want, and then we let it figure out how to do it. Link is really awesome. And in fact, it lets us add a lot of functional style programming to our c -sharp code. But talking about functional programming is definitely a topic for another day. And this really brings us to the end of looking at the basics of Lambda expression and link in c -sharp. Now I will have a couple bonus videos in this series, one that will take a look at using captured variables with a for loop, and one that will dive into the syntax of the join method. That one's really fun because it actually has five parameters and three of those are delegates, which means that we'll end up with three different Lambda expressions in our code. Sounds scary, but it's really not that hard once we break the pieces down. So until then, be sure to visit www.jeremybytes.com for more information, and we'll see you next time.